How did the first followers of Jesus present the gospel to the people of that time? How should that affect the way we present the gospel? Hello, friends, and welcome. Thanks so much for listening. In this podcast, we're going to be looking at evangelism in the book of Acts. In the XICF Manthanos double slash Kairos youth group this summer, this was our theme all summer long. Each week, we looked at a different sermon in the book of Acts, and it became really revealing the way the first followers of Jesus preached the gospel. And so in this podcast, we're going to look at many of the evangelistic encounters in the book of Acts, many of the sermons in the book of Acts, and we're just going to seek to learn from them. How did the first followers of Jesus present the gospel to the people of that time? How should that affect the way we present the gospel today? What can we learn from them? What's different about the way the gospel was presented by the first followers of Jesus with the ways that we hear the gospel presented now in our lifetime? And is that concerning? Are there differences? Do we need to change the way we present the gospel to be closer to the way that the first followers of Jesus presented the gospel? We're going to look at all of that as we go through these gospel presentations in the book of Acts. And this was actually birthed out of the youth's desire to share the gospel. When we did a survey of topics that we could cover this summer, one of the highest ranking topics was evangelism, how to share my faith. And as I began to think about evangelism and how to teach others to share their faith, I thought it would be worthwhile to look first at how the first followers of Jesus shared their faith. So we're going to look at a lot of scripture, do some summary, and then at the end, see what we can learn from the first followers of Jesus and the way that they did evangelism. Bible scholar F.F. Bruce points out that one of Luke's motifs in the book of Acts is the dominant role of the Holy Spirit in the expansion of the gospel. So that's something that we always want to keep in mind, that there is inherently something supernatural about what God is doing in the expansion of his kingdom on the earth, and it's being empowered by the working of his Holy Spirit through the lives of his people. And so that's something that should never be lost as we begin to look at evangelism in Acts. We're not looking for a dry boilerplate strategy that we can use specific words, a script that we can go and repeat like a parrot, because ultimately the preaching of the gospel is empowered by the Holy Spirit. And the expansion of the kingdom of God in the earth comes through our relationship to God. So just like Christ, it's the people of God who first walk in intimacy with God, walk in relationship with God, and then there's a natural outward expression of that life that is on the inside of us, and that's what we call fruit. So we have to keep in mind that this should never become some kind of lifeless corporate endeavor where we're seeking principles and strategies as much as we're seeking to learn from how the Holy Spirit works, how he moves, and what he is calling us to do today. Having said that, if we realize the message of the first century followers of Jesus looks quite different than the 21st century followers of Jesus, then of course there's probably something there that should be addressed. So let's jump right into it. Let's get into Acts. The first sermon we see in Acts is in Acts chapter 2 from verses 14 to 41. And so what has happened here is the Holy Spirit has been poured out. The disciples of Jesus were waiting in Jerusalem because he told them to wait until they received the promised Holy Spirit. So they were all waiting for the promised Holy Spirit. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. They began to speak in tongues and other people heard them and were amazed. And then some people started making fun of them and said, no, look, they're all drunk. And then we'll pick up at verse 14. It says, but Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. 
even on my male servants and female servants. In those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood, before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. But David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad, and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades, or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses." being therefore exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Okay, so in this passage, quick breakdown, we have Peter explaining a miracle. From verses 17 to 21, he's talking about people speaking in tongues, the tongues of fire, this visible manifestation of the Holy Spirit. He's saying this is what Joel was talking about, these signs on the earth, people hearing the wonders of God proclaimed in their own language. And then Peter references these Old Testament passages, Joel 2, Psalm 16, Psalm 110. And these scriptures, he says, are talking about Jesus, whom you knew, whom you crucified, whom God raised. And he says It's Jesus who is now pouring out the Holy Spirit, and that's what you guys are seeing today. And Jesus is Lord and Christ. If you listen to the podcast, What is a Christ? And the importance in the Jewish mindset of who the Christ was, that Jesus was the anointed one of God. He was the Messiah chosen to lead God's kingdom forever. And that was a big deal because everyone was waiting for the Messiah to deliver them. And he's saying, Jesus is this one that we have been waiting for. And then he has a call to action. He responds to a question from someone who's heard his message saying, what should we do? He says, you need to repent, be baptized, and you too can receive the Holy Spirit. And so Peter identifies with his audience because he they're his people. He's a Jew. These are Jews and he identifies with them, but he also calls them out for their specific role in the crucifixion of Jesus, because these are people who are in Jerusalem. Some of these people may have been in the same crowd that shouted to crucify Jesus and get Barabbas instead. So these people are particularly, personally responsible for handing their Messiah over to the Romans to be crucified, and Peter calls them out for that. And you see this repentance, this turning, that they're cut to the heart, and they repent, and they turn, And 3,000 people are baptized and join, come into the faith in that one day. 
So as we look at that, what do we see that is like the way that we might hear the gospel proclaimed today? And what do we see that's different than the way that we might hear the gospel proclaimed today? We're not going to try and answer those questions right now. We're going to keep moving through these uh, evangelistic encounters in the book of Acts, but those are questions we need to keep before us. All right, so let's look at the second sermon now in Acts. This is Acts chapter 3, verses 11 to 26. And here once more, we have Peter explaining a supernatural phenomenon. So they have healed this beggar at this temple gate called Beautiful, and the people have rushed to them, and they're wondering what has happened. And so Peter takes advantage of this opportunity to explain this miracle to the people and to tell the people about Jesus. Let's see what he says, Acts 3, 11 to 26. While he clung to Peter and John, that's talking about the man who had been healed, all the people, utterly astounded, ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's. And when Peter saw it, he addressed the people, Men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us, as though by our own power or piety we have made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. But you denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you, and you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. And his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given the man this perfect health in the presence of you all. And now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets, that his Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all the things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. Moses said, The Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. You shall listen to him in whatever he tells you. And it shall be that every soul who does not listen to that prophet shall be destroyed from the people. And all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and those who came after him also proclaim these days. You are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant that God made with your fathers, saying to Abraham, and in your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. God, having raised up his servant, Send him to you first to bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. So a quick breakdown of this sermon, and as I do this, maybe just keep in mind some similarities to the first sermon and some differences. What's the same as the first sermon that Peter preached, and what's different? So we have Peter explaining a miracle. This lame man is healed. Peter sees the crowd gathering and seizes the moment. He identifies with his audience in verse 13, and he says, This miracle was done through Jesus, whom you delivered to Pilate, you denied, and you killed. But God raised him up. And you acted in ignorance, and so through your ignorance, through your deeds, God fulfilled the the prophecies of Messiah's suffering. And so now you should repent for forgiveness, for times of refreshing, and so that he may send the Christ, that Jesus might come back again. So right now, heaven receives Jesus. In other words, Jesus reigns and remains in heaven until the time to restore all things comes. So here's a quote from F.F. F. Bruce. He says, Peter's words mean this, the gospel blessings destined to flow from Jesus's death and resurrection must spread throughout the world. Then, and not till then, will he return from the right hand of power. Then he goes on, he says that Jesus is the fulfillment of what Moses talked about and all other Old Testament prophecies. He says, you are descended from the prophets and from the covenant, and so God sent Jesus, the Messiah, to you first. But the blessing is also for all the families of the earth. The first opportunity to enjoy it was extended to Abraham's own family first, but it's going to be for all nations. He says, it's come to turn you from wickedness. Again, a quote from F.F. Bruce says, 
They had not paid heed to him at first when God sent him. Let them pay heed now, when God in his pardoning grace was giving them a second opportunity. Otherwise, they would forfeit the covenant blessing. So, that was Peter's second encounter with these citizens of Jerusalem. Again, just keep in mind, how is the gospel being presented to these people? And is it different from how we present the gospel today? And if so, how? Okay, let's keep moving on through these evangelistic encounters in the book of Acts. The next two are very, very brief sermons by Peter. One is only four verses, and one is only three verses. We see Peter's third sermon in the book of Acts in Acts chapter 4, verses 8 to 12. And this is after uh, Peter has been arrested. Peter and John have been arrested uh, because they healed this guy, and they were preaching in the name of Jesus. And so they come, and they, the Sadducees arrest them, and the next day they're meeting before the elders and the scribes. They're all gathered together. The high priest is there. And this is what Peter says to them, beginning in verse 8 of chapter 4. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. So again, a quick summary. Peter is explaining this miracle, the miracle that he was also talking about in the previous sermon, but notice that it says that he was filled with the Holy Spirit, and so we never want to pass over that because that's just critical in the proclamation of the gospel. It says that Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit, so we see that being filled with the Holy Spirit is not a one-time thing, but as Paul says in Ephesians, be being filled. It's a, you know, we get multiple occasions of the same people in Acts being filled with the Holy Spirit. So Peter gets filled with the Holy Spirit. He begins to explain this miracle. He says the miracle was done through Jesus, whom you crucified, whom God raised. He's God's chosen one. He's the source of our salvation. And Peter again uses Old Testament scripture, quoting Psalm 118 from verses 22 to 23. Now, one of the differences here is that there's no call to action. This is a very brief sermon. He's just explaining himself to these rulers, but at the same time, making this bold proclamation about Jesus. The next sermon by Peter is in Acts 5, 29 to 32. And again, he's been arrested. So maybe that should be part of our contemporary evangelism strategy, uh, not to be fearful, but to learn from the examples of the first followers of Jesus here, Peter is being arrested and they're saying, look, we told you not to preach about this man, not to talk about, uh, not to teach in this name. Don't, talk, don't say the name of Jesus anymore. And apparently some things never change because people will, will be okay if you talk about God or if you talk about love or if you talk about we should all love each other and you know whatever, kind of these general terms. But the moment that you talk about Jesus, people just start to get mad. There's an antichrist spirit in the world that hates Jesus, doesn't want to hear his name, and um, we see this violent reaction from the Pharisees. He says, we strictly charged you not to teach in this name, and yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. So uh, they're accusing Peter. They're saying, look, Stop talking about Jesus. You you want to talk about God, you want to read the Torah, that's fine, but don't talk about Jesus anymore. But listen to Peter's response. This is his fourth little sermonette now in the book of Acts. He says, but Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. And it says, when they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. Again, sadly, um, that still happens today. That, uh, that is one of the responses of people who oppose Christ is that they are enraged and they want to kill people you know, it's, it's, it almost is a proof in and of itself that Jesus is truly the Lord. When you see communists who 
would say that they don't believe in God, and yet they're so threatened by people preaching Jesus. And they want to kill people, not not only communist Hindus in India that want to kill Christians, Muslims in the Middle East that want to kill Christians. I don't know of anywhere in the world where a Muslim or a Hindu or a communist could go and proclaim their beliefs and be in danger of being killed by Christians who don't want them to share their beliefs. But the opposite is not true. There are countless places in the world where Christians are under threat of death from Muslims, from Hindus, from communists, and they're threatened by the name of Jesus. And it has been that way for 2,000 years. But let's circle back. Sorry if I uh, got off track there. But the summary here of what Peter has proclaimed is that Peter is there to define the orders of the Sanhedrin to not use the name of Jesus, but he says that God raised Jesus, whom you killed, and he refers to Deuteronomy chapter 21, 22 to 23. So again, he's still appealing to the authority of Scripture with those that he knows honor the Scripture. He says that uh, God exalted him as leader and as Savior and to give repentance to Israel and the forgiveness of sin. So that's also a theme that we see recurring about the Jesus as leader, Messiah, Savior, and Jesus as the one who uh, brings forgiveness of sins and who pours out the Holy Spirit. And he says, God gives his Holy Spirit to those who obey. So we're beginning to see kind of these uh, same motifs, these same uh, points of information that are coming out in the presentation of the gospel as we've looked at the first four sermons that Peter has given in the book of Acts. And so just think about those. Think about how they are similar to the way that we might proclaim the gospel today, to the way that we might share the gospel with somebody today, and how are they different. And we're going to continue looking at evangelism in the book of Acts. We hear your tenderness In every star that glows In every cell that grows It's clear Your excellence God, you're beautiful 